Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hamprick. And I'm Carl Shute. And today... On the Online Great Books Podcast, we are going to be talking about What Little Bit of Small is Beautiful by E.F. Schumacher that I read and Carl read. I had a lot of people tell me I needed to read this book, and normally if, some, if I have a number of people tell me to read something that's not, you know, if I have a bunch of people say, hey man, you really need to list, uh, read Freakonomics, well, everybody says that, I don't care. But if I have a bunch of people tell me to read something that's a little off the beaten path, I take that as some sort of a sign and we'll pick it up. And, you know, that's how Wendell Berry found me. I didn't find him. And that was wonderful. And I have some other examples like that. Uh, Joseph Pieper, I think, uh, is one. Others. And uh, they recommended this one. And uh, that was not the case with Schumacher. I was a little surprised to get your... Extreme negative reaction to Schumacher. I'm eh, it's curious not... to figure out why. Well, 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 we'll get there. But I went on to read an email from a guy. He says, I've been reading Small is Beautiful in an attempt to finish it before the next podcast comes out. And he said, giving its environmental bent, I've given a, a couple of articles below that you might want to talk about. And he's got some here about uh, microplastics and chemicals in the water, you know, affecting sperm counts. He also says, I want to say that I love your podcast and look forward to it every week. And he hopes to join us at OGB soon. He says, a couple of books you might consider throwing in the Infinity Stack or Confederacy of Dunces. Uh, I've heard that one before, too. I've read it. I have not. Shall we read it? When you have a break before, because it's kind of long. Yeah. And then he also recommends Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. I am not a Cormac McCarthy fan. I read The Road, and I hated it. Yeah. Not because it was bad, but because it was sad. Right. And I hear Blood Meridian is more the same. And it's been recommended by Sully, our friend Dr. Sullivan, recommended it to me. So I think I have it in my... In your infinity stack? So here's the thing. Carl has an infinity stack, and I have one, and then we have one. So what, we're really looking at three infinities of books here. Is a triple infinity bigger than a regular infinity? Yes, it has to be. How could it not be? But they're both infinity. Right. right. But the problem with all of this is is that infinity doesn't actually exist. That's a bullshit idea. (laughs) There's no such thing as infinity. That's the name for an algorithm. Just keep counting. There can't be more stuff than there is, but there's always more if it's infinite. What? I don't know. That doesn't hold together very well. Do I want to get into my problem with Small is Beautiful, or do we want to talk about his premises first? Uh, well, we can talk about it, the premises first. So Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered. Uh, it seems like it's a collection of essays of problems of production. One of the big themes in it is, which was striking me, is uh, we have an economy that is premised on really cheap energy. Yes. Uh, and he doesn't think that can last, and perhaps it can't. Some things that I liked about it, I, I liked the questioning that he does of GNP as a measure of the goodness of an economy. I liked his arguments, which we can get into in detail, about the dependence of ethics on metaphysics and that all economics is based on a metaphysics. I think that's important. I thought the socialism talk, socialism talk at the end didn't quite follow, but I don't think you got that far. Well, I, I read the epilogue because I... Third, I was supposed to. There were lots of things I underlined and said, yeah. Yeah, me too. Well, for me, the difficulty, like one of his big uh, things that he talks about in the end of the book, as far as corporate governance, uh, is this principle of subsidiarity, which I love. It's a big Catholic thing, except it's never followed. And so the principle of subsidiarity is that it is an injustice. It is wrong for the larger governmental body or organization to do jobs that the smaller one could do. Right. And and that's not just a Catholic thing, right? Like our constitution and supposedly our governmental system was built that way. We have a, sure. uh, uh, oh my God, I just forgot the name of it. The enumerated powers clause. 
The power yeah. is not enumerated for the federal government or to, f- to flow down to the states and their subsidiaries. The problem with that is I'm reading at the end and I'm saying, who's going to enforce this? Nobody ever enforces this. This is the same problem with uh, that Belloc deals with in that essay on distributism. You're going to have to use power mm-hmm. to make this happen. No, libertarians say you just educate everybody and their love of freedom will bring it about. Yeah. How's that working? I wish it, I wish it worked that way. We're freer than we've ever been. It's the freest nation on earth, Carl. I, um, I could just feel the freedom. Like I put my mask on today and went to the post office and I felt so free. <laughs> I've deleted uh, most of my social media. Yeah. Lest I say something wrong. Right. So I'm I'm awfully free. I'm swimming in freedom. And then you record four hours of uh, off the cuff audio yeah, and print. <laughs> but this is ephemeral, and I'll just deny it. Right. Like Shaggy, it wasn't me. It was a deep fake, Carl. It wasn't. <laughs> That's me. right. It was deep fake, Carl. Schumacher was a German who ended up in England and studied at Oxford under uh, John Maynard Keynes. Keynes. He's the Keynesian economics guy, right? He's the quantitative easing man. And Schumacher was one of his, I guess, star pupils before he uh, ultimately, I don't know that he repudiates him, but he kind of, he zigs where Kynes zagged, maybe. On on page 24, he says, uh, he shed, in this first chapter, Schumacher shed a little light on Keynes that I had not yet seen. It was probably there all along, but... Keynes says that we can print the money that we need and that the government government spending will replace increases demand and can replace consumer demand when consumer demand isn't there. And that's the whole idea behind stimulus, right? Mm-hmm. The thing that you know that I never really hear enough about is how they justify taking on the debt to do that and or printing the money to do that. Here he says, here he essentially says that Keynes is a is a progressive and he thinks that our productivity and our economic possibilities in the future are so enormous that we can't really borrow enough money now that those future possibilities couldn't pay it back. So hmm. you can imagine, again, we're talking about Edwardian man here, right? Like when was Keynes born? I don't know, but he had seen everything go from horse and buggies to uh, ultimately you saw the atomic age. So for him, he's like, yeah, well we can borrow a few trillion dollars right now. We're getting ready to have like the car that runs on water and won't matter. Everything will be so productive that we can't possibly borrow enough money uh, that we get, get in trouble. He says the time for all this is not yet for at least another hundred years. We must pretend to ourselves and to everyone that fair is foul and foul is fair for foul is useful and fair is not avarice and usury and precaution must be our gods for a little longer still for only they can lead us out of the tunnel of economic necessity into daylight. So, you know, he, he thinks that he's this is this stupid ass Gene Roddenberry Star Trek economy. He's like, we're going to get there and we'll be out of economic necessity into a world of plenty. And then we can be concerned with ethics and the good and character and all of that. And Blah! the quadrillions in debt we'll have by then. Right. But it won't right. matter because we don't even need money. Uh, Ray Kurzweil says that we're going to put uh, resistors in your butt and you'll be a transhuman and, and you'll have a 3D print. I don't even know. These people are crazy. Yeah, and so uh, on page 25, Schumacher says this is there are three propositions that make this work, if it's going to work. One, that universal prosperity is possible, that its attainment is possible on the basis of mysteri- materialist philosophy of enrich yourselves, and that this is the road to peace. And the question, whether universal prosperity is possible... I don't know that he gives a, a good answer to this. The problem is, in the previous chapter, he'd made this remark concerning energy supplies, which are, you know, we've done pretty well. We found a whole bunch, but they're still finite, unlike my infinity pile. Mm-hmm. And so he says on 15, let's take a closer look at this natural capital. First of all, most obviously, there are fossil fuels. No one, I am sure, will deny that we are treating them as income items, although they are undeniably capital items. Okay, so uh, I have never run a business, but I presume if you're running a business and you're spending your capital to pay your bills rather than your income, 
that that's a bad thing. Yep. Do we need a, an accounting example? Sure. If you ever go to one of these estate sales and you'll see a house, it's a big, fine home, and, you know, grandma and grandpa live there, whatever. You go in there and it's completely worn out. Those people were living on their depreciation. Like you'll go in there and like the st- maybe the, maybe one of the burners in the stove doesn't work. It needs a new roof and it's been leaking around the chimney. They were living on their depreciation. They're gone now, and somebody's now going to have to spend um, three hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars to make that ho- get that house up and running again. Put a new roof on it. Get rid of the old shag carpet that her poodle peed on, and whatever. But th- they were spending their capital through depreciation. It was dissaving is one another thing that economists sometimes call it. And if your house is the earth, I, 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 stop me if I start to sound like a hippie, Carl, because I, I don't want to sound, that's the last thing I want to sound like. <laughs> and one of the things it has are sources of energy, natural gas and oil. You have X amount. And when you use it up, it's gone. It's, it's some of your capital. If you spend it, it's, it's gone. It, it's irreplaceable. He's saying that, in terms of accounting, our energy needs to be taken out of the uh, profit and loss section and put on the balance sheet. We need to treat it like an asset instead of an expendable. Seems right. So that thought right there, that's something that nobody really wants to talk about. If that's true, if there is, I've, I've read some of the conspiracy stuff, the abiotic origins of oil, but presume that that's true. <laughs> right. You know, like oil just comes out of the earth. I drive 25 minutes to church. That's a long way. That's an awfully long way. Um, none of this is possible without pretty cheap energy. Uh, just look around your neighborhood, look at your life. What would it be like if you had to walk everywhere? Or ride your horse? You know, so the environmentalists don't ever talk about this. That if they're right, if in fact they're right, the only way out is complete immiseration (sighs) and depopulation. You cannot keep living like you live. Well, before we get that far, I agree. Schumacher agrees. This talk of energy, I was reading some stuff on a blog the other day, one of my favorite blogs that I won't name. And the guy was writing about peak oil. You won't name it because we're swimming in freedom. Right. The guy was talking about peak oil. And there are people that debate. You know what the debate? So peak oil is the idea that we have X amount of reserves. And at some point, our consumption passes our ability to increase the reserves. And at that point, oil becomes more and more dear. It doesn't mean that you've run out. It just means that the supply and demand curves will have crossed and the prices go up and the economic calculus changes entirely. The debate about peak oil is almost entirely about when it happens, which is the right debate because it will happen. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. But economic policy, business internal policy, you know, that's internal to businesses, household economics, it completely disregards the question. Nobody even talks about it. Yeah. And if it, if that's the case, if the earth is not spontaneously generating oil out of its innards, you know, through seawater and pressure and time and volume, I don't know, that's a problem. And uh, you've got how many billion people on this planet, which are only able to be there because... Well, we're using the oil to fertilize the fields that we're ruining the soil quality. And I'm based on free energy. And it's not sustainable. That's a a big buzzword today. It doesn't seem to be sustainable. But nobody talks about the actual cost of what this would be But, but and how you might solve it. Avarice and usury and precaution must be our guards for a little longer because they can lead us out of this tunnel of economic necessity. You know, if we could just keep spending on R&D and using this energy to the end of developing fusion, we'll solve this forever, you see. So we develop fusion? Well, or, or, or whatever, right? Uh, well, fusion the, might actually solve it. Right. It, it might actually solve it, but if you can't do that, 
dilithium crystals. With fusion, you could get a whole lot of energy out of seawater, and it's it's not infinite, but it's a whole lot. And it's clean. Yeah, and uh, that would solve lots of problems, but, you know, we've been waiting on that for a long time. He makes some arguments that we shouldn't even do it, even if we could. And and by the way, <laughs> I'm going to get us canceled right now. <laughs> you cannot have atomic or nuclear energy and affirmative action and live very long. You have to have the finest minds and the finest craftsmen and the finest technicians in the world, 1,000% error-free and totally vigilant, 24 hours a day until the end of time, to not die from that. And I've got a bunch of friends who are engineers and technophiles and and uh, have a very hopeful outlook. And I got an argument with one of them at my book group about this the other night. I'm kind of like Dick Cheney on this. He had this, he had this 1% di- dictum he talked about. He says, if there's a 1% chance that a country has a nuclear weapon and will use it against you, you have to act like they're going to use it against you. I think if there's a, a non-zero chance that that atomic or nuclear energy spoliates the world, then you have to act like it's going to, and you have to avoid it. The risks yeah. are too great. Yeah, you've got to be right about it. Ionizing radiation is a big deal. So if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, you can't just hire people Mm-mm. because they fit categories. They better know their job. They better be perfect at it. It's like um, like your surgeon. You know, your surgeon can't be ninety five percent right. It has to be all the way right. Yep. Maybe fusion would solve this problem, but if it doesn't, so people who are pushing, gosh, I don't want to get in modern politics, but environmental movement who are, who are saying, you know, alternative energy source and all that, they never tell you that there will never be enough energy from alternative energy sources. It can't be done. There's not enough windmills that you could put on the planet. Plus, you wouldn't want to put windmills all over the planet because it ruins the planet. It can't be done. So it would require a profound change in the way you view prosperity, which I think is a theme of the book, that small is beautiful. What do you mean the windmills ruin the planet? I'm asking the questions for the listeners. Uh, well, they kill all the birds. They look like shit. They don't run very well. They run down and then you can't do anything with them. I have a question about windmills that no one has ever answered to my satisfaction. Maybe maybe a listener knows this. So your farmer, shoot. And you lease spots for windmills to Northern Missouri Light and Electric, whatever. And they put some towers on there, and then they go bankrupt. What happens to those towers? Are you just stuck with these 350-foot-tall giant things Mm -hmm. with the the North? Like, is there no money in escrow? So if you're a farmer or you're a landowner, and they put those on your property, you need monies in escrow for the disassembly and recovery of your property in the event that they go bankrupt. Uh, good luck. Well, if they won't give you that, do not make that lease because these companies, companies go bankrupt, guys. Well, we have a near us. We have a a state of Illinois mental health facility uh, that the state closed. Right. And it's sitting there empty, and it's got asbestos in the walls, and who knows what in the soil. Uh, and my town can't sell it and can't build on it, hasn't done anything about it. It's just vacant, empty, falling apart buildings that can't, nothing can be done with them. Right. Now, imagine that that building isn't a building that's haunted by crazy people who are dead, Uh, but it's a strontium depository. Mm Mm-hmm. Schumacher tells a story in here somewhere about... Uh, the strontium waste from nuclear power plants or atomic power plants. I don't know what the difference is exactly. In England, it's a liquid. It's a radioactive liquid. It has a half-life, I think it was 5,800 years. And it has to be continually cooled by circulating water. Now, what sort of a genius thought that we could create a water circulation system that will run continuously, continuously without fault for 5,800 years. No political entity on the planet has ever lasted 5,800 years. That's insane. To keep the thing running. And so uh, it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. It'll eventually 
it, once the circulating system fails, it'll eventually get hot enough to, I don't know, melt to the core of the earth. And I, like, what, what are we doing? So all of you people out there, including my friend Clay, I'm going to send this to him. who are like, oh, we can use this safely. It's like, today maybe. Like, what, what are we doing? Well, we got to have the power to live the way that we live. Right. The, so you either have to get the power to live the way that you live or you have to change the way that you live. Right. Uh, which nobody wants to talk nobody about. Nobody wants to do. Because we're all on the internet using, you know, 200 watt power supplies on our internet machines constantly. It's, it's, a, it's a scary, scary problem. And he says the whole economy is predicated on this. If only we could get a really able government, if we could eradicate by simply making faster use of science and technology and a more radical, effective use of the penal system, then we'd arrive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's presuming that there will be continued cheap energy. Right. Things will change in a hurry if there's not cheap energy. Well, let's just, you know, even if we set the energy thing aside, this idea that faster, more effective use of science and technology. And Schumacher essentially says in this book that government is, in fact, a technology. I agree with that. It was a development, a technological development. It was a piece of intellectual property that was created when we moved out of a, I don't know, chieftain-style, you know, tribal government system into uh, governments with laws, a Thomist government, right? That promulgates their laws and they're in, in accordance with the values of the people. And that, that was, that was a technological achievement. I think. Just Carl shaking yeah. his head up and down. You just went through the definition of law and Thomas. And I was trying to think of what it was. I know there's five bits, an ordinance of reason for the common good promulgated by him who has care for the community. There you go. That's the five. Yeah. Inside that he can actually, he who has care for the community can actually punish Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 So even if you're not Thomas, like, God, man, the guy throws some bombs, man, <laughs> like that. His stuff on natural law and second part of the first part, right? Mm. First part of the second part? First part. One of those parts. <laughs> so freaking good, man. I don't care who you are. This would be the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas that we're speaking of, the big Summa. Carl calls it the bad Summa. Well, I like the Summa Contra Gentilis better. Nerd. It's not the uh, bad Summa. It's the not as good Summa. No, you call one of them the good Summa. Yeah. So that, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you're the bad Summa. It's like you're the good brother. Does that mean there's yes. another one who's the bad brother? Yes. That's some zero-sum thinking. Uh, there's only two brothers. If one of them's <laughs> the good one, the other one is not. It could be the less good one. The okay one. Nothing makes... This is on page 34, and I use this all the time. I took calculus, Carl, or calculus took me. And we were taught to use to when we, uh, oh, it's been so long since I did this. I'm taking these Riemann sums, you know, doing these sums. And then you're taught to like take maxes and mins, and you take left sums and right sums, and you know, all this stuff. Looking at questions or problems or machines or anything in front of you and trying to figure out how that thing will behave at maximums and minimums is very useful. Engineers do it all the time, and I think we should. And I think about that all the time. Kant does that. Like, what if everybody did this? It's a great tool. And he says, nothing makes economic sense unless its continuance for a long time can pre be projected without running into absurdities. Is it okay to do something economically that you can't always do? Well, it's okay for you. Is it? It's not okay for your kids. Well, okay. There you go. What about borrowing money? Is it okay to borrow money to buy a house today if you can't do that every day? Well, that would be a one-time change. Okay. Okay. That's not a repeated activity. Is it okay to buy a house every week? Right. No. Behind you, your question is the question about usury and monetary systems, I presume. You know, is it ever okay to, to debt finance? It's not just debt. 
It's like money and capital, the behavior of money and capital can be modeled as a mathematical function. And they are, uh, you know, it's compounding interest. They're exponential functions. Infinity does not exist. It doesn't. Come at me. It doesn't exist. It's a heuristic that we use to think about things that are smaller than we can measure or larger than we can measure. And that makes the math come out usable. But they don't, it, it doesn't exist. Sorry, I don't care what they told you when you got your PhD out there, whoever you are. Uh, it doesn't exist. Well, that's why the, the arrow never hits you. Because it has to traverse an infinity of points before it gets to you. Right. And it's impossible to traverse an infinity of points in a finite amount of time. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't exist. It's just fraught with paradoxes. <laughs> anyway, we live in a finite, finite world with a finite number of resources, whether it's man hours, whether it's energy, whether it's just the cubic volume of the earth. Anything that compounds, no matter how small, will eventually consume everything in the cosmos. So if your economic activity requires increasing amounts of pig iron, energy, manpower, nitrogen, anything you can think of, and you have a, an economic policy that requires 1.8% uh, GDP growth every year, you can't do that very long. Because even at a very, very small compounding rate, it, is, it eventually consumes everything. Yeah, it's frightening. People have been telling us about the energy crunch for a long, long time, and it hasn't happened yet. And Has so you it? can start to think it's not going to happen. Right. Um, but, you know, where does the energy come from? Uh, solar energy, I don't think you could build enough solar panels, not to mention that those are terrible to build. You cannot build a like number of solar panels from the energy created by solar panels. They are a net energy loser. Yeah. So when we're faced with unsolvable problems like this, uh, you either find more energy, you build a Dyson sphere <laughs> around your sun and gather every bit of energy your sun can grab, which you couldn't do even with all the mass of the solar system. So don't do it. Um, in science fiction, they have to make up like matter transmuters to make it happen, which if you had the matter transmuter, why would you need the Dyson sphere? I don't get it. Or you have to change how you live, which no one wants to do. No. He says on 40, instead of overcoming the world by moving towards saintliness, he tries to overcome it, this would be modern man, by gaining preeminence in wealth, power, science, or indeed any imaginable sport. I think Schumacher, sometimes it's Buddhist, sometimes it's Christian, talks about wisdom. You need wisdom in order to live correctly, not uh, GNP and increased productivity and efficiency. Productivity at what? Efficiency at what? Um, those are some of the things I liked about it. I like it too. He says on, the, on page 41, Gandhi has given the answer to this problem. There must be recognition of the existence of the soul apart from the body and of its permanent nature. And this recognition must amount to a living faith. And in the last resort, nonviolence does not avail those who do not possess a living faith in the God of love. So in other words, you got to recognize that people are special and quit spending them and spending their future. Make sure that your economic processes don't do violence to people in the future. Certainly not now, but even in the future. Mm -hmm. Chapter three, he talks about uh, the role of economics and decision making and policy making. And the, 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 the thesis, I think, of chapter three is that economics reduces all things to quantities without regard to quality. And as a result, it's very easy to use and it's a powerful heuristic. And because of that, it is prone to usurp all other sciences. Page 48, the logical absurdity harvests not the greatest falls of the undertaking. What is worse and destructive of civilization is the pretense that everything has a price, or in other words, that money is the highest of all values. You, you can put everything on a balance sheet and evaluate it in that way. Well, maybe you can, but maybe you can't. Yeah. Cost-benefit analyses. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, what is a benefit? Benefit yeah. uh, To benefit somebody is to do good or to do well by that person. Well, that requires you to understand the good. Right. 
Okay, yeah. so uh, Michael Jackson records Billie Jean becomes incredibly rich, gets paid. That would be a benefit, right? Yeah. Except that that benefit didn't benefit him because it allowed him to indulge some quirks of Michael Jackson's character. <laughs> like what? Uh, like his um, <laughs> dysphoria. His shopping addiction. His inappropriate... You know, there's some things that he did. If he hadn't gotten rich, he would have been that guy in the church in Gary, Indiana with the good voice. You probably don't want your kids to go over to his house. Right. You know, uh, instead of guy with Neverland Ranch, he's got kids by the, the, the barrelful coming over and using surgery to make his face look different. You know, it's it's not a benefit. No. I've talked about the Republic five times today. Beginning of the Republic, what is justice? Justice is paying back what's owed. Well, what if it's an an axe that you you borrowed from your neighbor and he wants it back because he's going to go kill his wife or, or plan some violence? Do, is this a good thing? Is this just to give back the axe? It's not an axe, but I can't remember what it is. Sword it's or sword. something. Yeah. It's not so simple what benefits and debts are. Economics doesn't care at all. About that. He claims here on page 51, economists are unable to make any sort of statements or claims about pathological growth, unhealthy growth, disruptive growth, destructive growth, perverse growth. It's just growth. Yep. Obviously, you and I are communists. <laughs> I'm no communist. Yeah, it's scary stuff. I mean, this has been kind of a theme of ours that we've, we've developed the holistic agriculture thing. And you have to look at the way you live. And is the way you live, I mean, is it a way that your great grandkids could live? Right. And if they can't, you're probably doing something wrong. Doesn't mean they have to, but uh, he says somewhere in this book, like until 50 years ago when he was writing, maybe 100 years ago, uh, society was reasonably stable. And now it's not. Now it's not. Now it's a locomotive, you know, barreling towards the ravine. That's my image, not his. You know, you could farm the fields that your that your great grandparents had farmed. Mm -mm. And in doing that, your granddad could tell you, "Hey, listen, uh, there's a spot down there. It's 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 just never yielded like the rest of it." And uh, this is what, how I've dealt with that. And uh, when you're plowing through there, be careful because it's rocky. Because everything is stable, there was advice he could give you. And everything has been disrupted and everything changes so quickly now that my ability, because of the rate of change in all things, my ability to parent has been infringed upon, in my opinion. Mm, you noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> this is not Schumacher. This is just a consequence of stuff that he brings up. This is Hambrickian. Yeah. Because of, you know, this pursuit of growth, a lot of things come about, right? It's not just we can now go buy a Tesla with Bitcoin. It's also we can buy a Tesla with Bitcoin. Like what is your great, great granddad who paid cash for a Surrey? What advice could he give you about that? Right. In the post-COVID United States, me, who has been dating or married uh, my wife since I was 16 years old, what am I going to tell my 18-year-old daughter about dating in the plague years with Tinder and Bumble and InstaSqueeze and all of that garbage? Like, I don't – my, my I'm like Arnold. My advices are irrelevant in a lot of ways. Yeah, but it's progress, right? Get on the train, it's good. So what you end up with is a whole is every successive generation is completely on their own and at sea. But GDP is up. Yep. But happiness is down and suicide is up. Yeah, that's qualitative. We did the cost benefit analysis on it. And she... standards of living are on the increase, Carl. I live in one of the 50 most livable cities in the United States. Whatever. As reported mm. by U.S. News and World Reports. Mm. That's why I'm going to have you read Kierkegaard soon. Okay. I dare you. 
<laughs> Show me what to read. I'll read it. Put it on the infinity stack. Yeah. One, one of the infinity Pro- stacks. Probably concept of anxiety. But we'll <laughs> I have some questions about government, Carl. I've noticed. So we just went through the whole daylight savings time debacle again a couple of weeks ago. I have never met a single person, and I know I have made the acquaintance of House of Representative members, the United States House, local state legislature uh, members. I have been the personal friend of high-ranking Oklahoma state officials. I have sat on an airplane next to James Inhofe, United States Senator. And I have never met anyone, whether they had some power in government or certainly not an electrician or a normal person, that liked daylight savings time. There has never been a politician that ran on that as a platform. I don't know a single person who likes it, and we have it. What is going on? What, how does government work? <sighs> that, that's the simplest thing in the world. Everybody hates it. It would take a number two pencil and four seconds to fix it. Now, we need to write it with an ink pen. It would take an ink pen and some paper to fix it. Roll call vote, unanimous in the House and the Senate. Nobody but a crazy person wouldn't ratify, wouldn't sign the bill. How does government work? We have something that is universally hated. Mm-hmm. And it happens every year. Twice mm-hmm. a year. Twice a year and everybody hates it. I don't know. I can make economic arguments that it's awful. You know, uh, people are late for work that because they set their clock wrong and they forgot. You know, on and on and on. Oh, sure. Uh, deaths go up. Everybody hates it, yet we have it. Well, uh, government is a, a an entity on its own. It's a leviathan, and it goes its way, and it, it, it attempts to preserve itself. It's the weirdest thing. Programs <laughs> never get canceled. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, we have 11th Street, which used to be a part of old Highway 66, Route 66. So they're always spending money trying to, you know, make some Route 66, you know, sort of attraction out of it. Nobody gives a shit about it. Baby boomers can't drive anymore. And the other day, not the other day, in the last year or so, they've taken that four-lane city street that used to be a, a state and national highway And they've made it three lanes, and they've taken a half lane on either side and put bicycle lanes in. I have never seen a bicycle on either of those lanes. Now, there might be somebody out here that's that's listening that's a bicyclist and enjoys that stuff. There might be people from the East Coast or maybe even uh, San Francisco that's more populous and more dense that likes bicycling. And, And I don't hate bicycling. But in Oklahoma, bicycling has an enormous stigma. If you see somebody in town on a bicycle, you think he lost his driver's license because he got a DUI. Or he's so crazy, he can't get his shit together and take the test and pass. Because that's that's 99% true. If you see somebody in the giant heartland of the United States that's on a bicycle. Now, if they've got on like the tight pants and the pointy hat and everything, okay, they're a hobbyist. But if you see just a guy going to and from on a bicycle, that sucker is probably dangerous. Well, and things are so far apart in Oklahoma. People on the coasts don't realize that. No. Middle of the country is big. Yeah. Oklahoma's like the size of England almost. Like it's, so if you see a guy on a bicycle, something didn't work out for that guy. So people around here don't ride bicycles. There's social stigma around it. It's also 110 degrees in the summer. There's three months a year. If you ride them, you'll die. But we have bicycle lanes in this town, and I don't know anybody. I've never seen them in use, and I don't know anybody but G.T. Bynum, the mayor, that wanted them. And I don't know why he wants them. How does government work? What's going on? Well, uh, I don't know. It's got a life of its own, but it's an organism made of people pushing their interests, big bicycle. But I hear what you're saying, but there's no big bicycle. There's no big daylight savings time. Like I, I know what you're saying about the bureaucrats, but the bureaucrats don't like getting up after the time change either. Like They don't even like it. I don't know, man. It's crazy. I don't know. I don't, know. I don't, know. It, I don't either. Chapter four, the so-called Buddhist economics. And I was thinking about this. <laughs> if things are the way they are, or they seem to be, I was reading this and thinking about my my mother's refrigerator. 
Mm, yep. And my own refrigerator. Uh, so he says here in the middle of 61. So, you know, in, in the West, in the weird countries, Western educated, industrialized, I don't know, there's an acronym for weird. We tend to throw things away. Right. And it turns out in the end, we have to. He says here, it would be the height of folly to make material so that it would wear out quickly and the height of barbarity to make anything ugly, shabby, or mean. And what has been said about clothing applies equally to all other human requirements. I have a refrigerator that is four years old, five years old. Mm -hmm. I don't know, made in 2016. I'm not sure when I bought it. The shelves are breaking. The LED panel on the front is broken. You know, one of the digits doesn't show up. And I think my mother had a refrigerator in that house for 35 years. Yep. And it still works. What the hell's going on? And we've gone through like four refrigerators in this house. We've been here 20 years, yep. a little less than 20 years. We've gone three or four refrigerators and, and uh, had a freezer in the garage break. My, my mom had a freezer. It's still out there in the garage that I had when I was a kid in 1980. This is a, an economics based on, heck, washers and dryers. Sales, just sales. Yeah, sales. So the point is not to help the consumer. The point is that you come back and buy a new washer and dryer or new refrigerator. Or we've had a few dishwashers too. The, because, because accounting is broke. Right, the GDP shows an bookkeeping entry if you buy a washer or a dryer or whatever it is. The GDP and the Chiron, the thing on the bottom of the television news station, doesn't say beans about the average refrigerator service life went up two tenths of a percent last month. Nobody cares. And, and frankly, the consumers don't care either because it's very, very difficult to determine which product's going to last the longest when you're standing in the store. It's really Wonderful. hard to figure out. I have a wood splitter, Carl, a hydraulic wood splitter, which Schumacher mm -hmm. probably wouldn't approve of. But it has a, a little Honda motor on it, five horse, pull it with a rope, starts right up. Well, uh, fuel was running out of the breather on it. And I, I I took it apart, and there's a little settling bowl on a carburetor that has a float in it. And when there gets too much fuel in there, that float, just like the thing in your toilet tank, floats up. And when it put, floats up, it presses a needle into a seat and shuts off more the, the fuel from coming into the carburetor so that it doesn't run, run too much fuel into the carburetor, fill the cylinder with the, with fuel, lock it up, whatever. Mine wasn't working right. So I thought, well, I'll get on the internet and I'll buy myself a carburetor kit and I will rebuild that carburetor and off we go. Carburetor kit was $18. A brand new entire carburetor was $22. <laughs> so here I am, conscientious, I think. I, I like to think I am. I try to be. I read my E.F. Schumacher books. I'm looking at this and thinking, would I rebuild that carburetor? Uh, take the risk of making errors and and have lose parts and all the other problems, plus have the time in it for the $4 difference in the, recarb the carburetor kit versus the new carburetor. Well, I bought a new carburetor. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to do that. So if any of you are calling me a hypocrite, that's fine. I, I think it's disgusting that the new carburetor was only $4 more than the kit. Should the kit have been a dollar? Should the carburetor have been $60? I don't know. But the whole economics of the system are jacked up. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't want you to fix stuff. They, right. you know, whoever it is, the accountants, the, the it doesn't pay. It doesn't help the, the profit margin of the company for you to fix, to be able to fix the things you buy from them. Right. What helps is you buy a new refrigerator. And my kid, I was talking about this to one of my kids, and she says, well, can't you just buy a different brand? Well, I don't think there are different brands. Not, I think they're all really. manufactured in the same places for the most part. Yeah, there's and, GE and Whirlpool and then different imprints on them. And I don't know, there's, there's starting to be some new brands. You know, Samsung makes some stuff, LG makes some stuff. 
my wife and I may have a reason to buy a number of new appliances at some point soon. And we've had, we had a nice house that we sold. We live in a barn now, but we had a nice house one time, I remember. And we had, quote, unquote, high-end appliances, like Viking and all that kind of shit, you know. They all broke. Mm -hmm. So Charity and I have been talking about, you know, buying appliances. And I said, hey, you know, you remember that Sub-Zero stuff we had and that Viking stuff we had and how it all broke? And And she says, yeah. So that was expensive. She, yeah. And I said, well, why don't we buy cheap stuff? Because it's going to break. I mean. It's going to break anyway. It's going to break anyway. So buy the thing buy- with the fewest electronic parts. Get no features. You no want features. no features. The salesman says, that, well, this one has. Nope. I don't want. I told you I didn't want any features. I want fewer features. Right. If I, I was going to say less features. But if my wife listened to this, she would say, no, features are discrete quantity. You say fewer. Yeah. Not yeah, less. That's when you should lock her out of the house. So I told her, I was like, we need to buy the absolute cheapest stuff we can find. The absolute cheapest shit we can find. And I don't want to be like that, but I don't have infinite monies. If I found out that there was a a lifetime refrigerator I could buy and was three times more than the other one, I would buy it. I I Mm -hmm. guarantee you, I would buy it. If it if you're like here's the one it's twelve hundred dollars and you'll need to get another one in seven years but here's the one that's going to last thirty years like Carl's mom and it's four grand I would buy that one N- no question at all I, I wouldn't even flinch yep but let me brag <laughs> Speed Queen washers and dryers you can still buy Speed Queen washers and dryers no digital nothing on them you turn the knob and it goes <laughs> and then you pull it out and the water comes out and it gets clothes clean. It's like all mechanical. Perfect. You mm-hmm. can still get that. Was there a promotional consideration? No, but I'm a big fan. Uh, yeah, he, he, he puts forth this idea of a Buddhist uh, economy that would consider mechanization only if it enhanced man's skill and power, uh, that wouldn't accept mechanization if it degraded the role of the craftsman or made the man less valuable. He just puts forth a number of ideas like that, and me being who I am, him calling it the Buddhist economy, kind of that kind of turned me off a little bit. Yeah. Now, <laughs> but but he's got some points, and the point is we could make economic decisions based on other criteria than we use now, and he makes a list of a number of criteria that I I like. He said, you know, a modern economist may engage in highly sophisticated calculations on determining whether full employment pays or whether it might be more economic to run an economy at less than full economic or full employment so as to ensure a greater mobility of labor, more stability of wages and so forth. But he says that in a Buddhist economy that the first criteria would be useful work for all people. Period. I know I'm going to get some emails. I'm going to get DMs from one guy at OGB. He's on thin ice with me about this stuff, and I'm sick of it. (laughs) Mobility. Like, I hate mobility. Mobility means your kids leave you. It means you don't know your grandparents except for the three or four Thanksgiving meals you had before Grandpa died. That's what mobility means, you bunch of people. Mobility means you're from the strip center and you don't have any sense of place. And so I ask you why you move around all the time. You don't know there's anything wrong with it because you're not from anywhere. The air where you're from smells like unleaded exhaust. (laughs) You don't know what the flora and fauna from where you're from smells like because there's not any. Where you you live live smells like creosote and exhaust. And you're always at home as long as you can smell that. That's what mo- economic mobility smells like. Well, let, I'm so mad about this shit. Let's make this argument a little. Let's let's use some rhetoric here, Scott. I think I just did. Let's use some different rhetoric. <laughs> yeah, the rootless mobile life. Let's let's speak to our modern people. Is it sustainable? You know, could you have a? Uh, populations moving all over the place. Schumacher talks about this. This is something else that I liked about the, I can't remember what chapter it's in, the rich provinces at the expense of the agricultural provinces. And he makes the point, I marked the quote down somewhere, 
the city economy is a secondary economy. It is not a primary economy. It is a secondary economy. I should find it and read his actual words. 215, page 215. I have a friend who's a farmer, and he has this hat that says, I work, you eat. Yep. The cities, with all their wealth, are merely secondary producers, while primary production, the precondition of all, the precondition of all economic life, takes place in the countryside. All right, so if you have your mobile society, I'm not saying people shouldn't be able to move, but where we just move, I'm not all that enamored with Illinois anymore, so I might be one of those, but... <sighs> But what happens, well, but I'm going the other way. I wouldn't go into the city. Well, and you're also a political fugitive. Like, let's be honest about it. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, there's more to it than, but I, I wouldn't be leaving the countryside to go to, into the cities. I'd be going the other way for, you know, for reasons. What you have is the tyranny of the cities over the countryside, the countryside that is the only way they're able to live. Right. But, you know, you look down on the rural areas because they're not educated. They're not sophisticated. They don't have Broadway shows running. They don't have the varied nightlife. They don't have the alternative lifestyles that you can lead, at least not as much of them. And uh, cities are great. Yeah, but cities are parasitical. You probably ought to have them, but you shouldn't make them the center of your culture, I don't think. I watch Strange Things on, on the YouTube uh, and there's this Russian girl. She's not from Vladivostok. She's from a one of the outlying towns somewhat close to Vladivostok, which if you've ever played Risk, you know, is on the very, very eastern part of Russia. <laughs> where is it in relation to Kamchatka? To, to where? Kamchatka. Uh, it would be uh, north. That's the I other think? place name I remember from Risk. That's all I yeah. know. It's like 11 time zones away from Moscow. And so it was interesting to see what people live like in the, the rural hinterlands of Russia and they're dirt poor, mm -hmm. you know, all living in one room. And of course, all the graffiti curse words are in English, <laughs> which uh, I found that all over the world. People curse in American. Yeah. But she made this comment because uh, she got to go to Moscow. She did a, an exchange year in the United States. But she goes to Moscow and, and it's this huge modern city by Russian standards. And 11% of the population of Russia lives in Moscow. It's no wonder that the rural regions are neglected. Mm -hmm. They don't even know anything about them. But if you don't have the rural regions, Moscow's not going to eat. Or Chicago's not going to eat. Or New York City's not going to eat. And uh, the focus on efficiency and GNP or GDP uh, and the finance sector and all the taxes that New York City pays because they have the finance sector there, you know, you're missing the... You, you got your economics upside down because with no food, no people. Well, but there's no value add for currency. It's a commodity, you see, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Like the only point in a modern economic system is to drive the price of the commodity down because that's a primary input. And we, we, we need to open up the margin available to secondary products so that we can have more technological advancements and there'd be more incentive to innovate. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, well, so the, another part where Schumacher is very good, I think, is his insistence that you have to have a good metaphysics. You have to have some idea of what a human being is, what a good life is. A good life might be eating food, sitting with your family, playing songs on instruments that you've got, uh, reading books together. It might not be travel to some festival in San Francisco. You know, it might not be that sort of thing. He says, page 61, for the modern economist, this is very difficult to understand. He is used to measuring the standard of living by the amount of annual consumption, assuming all the time that a man who consumes more is better off. Mm -hmm. I've been spending a lot of time with my uncles. All the group that's older than them is gone. They were all born in the early 40s. And I remember when my grandmother was around and all my grandparents and my grandparents all lived here in Oklahoma. This has only been a state for a little over a hundred years. They were, they were here. A lot of them were here before it was a state. They were here before there was any money here. And I don't mean like wealthy people. 
I mean specie or currency. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you'll hear people say, like Loretta Lynn, who I hate, will say we were poor, <laughs> but we didn't know it. Well, it's because they've redefined what poor means and they put it in terms of currency. You know, you could have lived in Oklahoma in 1891 and had a bumper crop of everything, the fattest hogs that ever you ever had, canned goods laid up, corn in the corn crib, fresh butter every single day, church is going good, your youngest daughter just got married to a great guy and they live down the way. Everything's great. No money. Are they poor? So Loretta Lynn was poor. So I, we'll have to do a music and ideas show where I just deuce on Loretta Lynn for two and a half hours. But she was definitely poor because they didn't have the butter. They didn't have all these other things that I was talking about. But poor, most of the time when you hear somebody say we were poor and we didn't know it, what they're really saying, and they don't know it, I think. Let me, let me tell you what they're actually thinking. It's being nasty is poverty has been redefined in turn, and so that it's measured almost entirely about what purchasing power you have. And it has, there's no regard for a good life or contentedness or any other sort, any other kinds of measures, measurements of well-being. And that has bothered me a great deal in the last few weeks. Like, it's probably bothered me a long time. But in the last few weeks, I've thought about it a lot. That changing definition of poverty <laughs> has made it difficult for me to convey to my kids what a good life might be, right? They don't want to be poor. Well, what does poor mean? <laughs> what does poor mean? Like, would my, mm -hmm. if, if both of my children got married, had three or four or five kids apiece, always had great groceries, uh, the property was paid for, never had a television, never even had air conditioning or refrigerator or anything like that, but everybody had good nourishment, good work, hung around with each other, told jokes, battery-powered radio or something, they listened to the Grand Ole Opry on Saturday. What's wrong with that? They would be below the poverty line. Uh, society wouldn't know what to do with them. They couldn't pay their taxes, right? You, you To keep your land, you have to have a certain amount of currency just to satisfy the, the county treasurer so they don't, mm -hmm. the sheriff doesn't come and toss you off. Schumacher recognizes this, and I recognize it. And there's one thing that he doesn't recognize, or at least he chooses to not recognize it in this book, that ruins the whole book for me. What's that? Probably, and I don't know if we're there yet, but he, he proposes, particularly for rural peoples, instead of trying to westernize them and bring high-tech industry with expensive inputs and uh, all of the baggage that comes with having a, I don't know, a, a semiconductor factory, <laughs> right? Or whatever the high, high tech industry would be. Instead of doing that, he says, we need to help them develop small technologies, technologies that fit where they are. He says, hmm. you can't go from being completely third world, you know, define that however you want in your mind, poor water quality, difficulty maintaining schedules. <laughs> I mean, all that stuff. You can't go from that directly to, building iPhones in central Louisiana. I mean, I was going to say some other country. You have to scaffold into those things. And he says that uh, we need to look at where these countries are, where their societies are, and provide them with tools, excellent quality tools that they themselves can repair and that will allow them to make products that they can sell in their own markets. He ain't wrong. But nothing that he proposes in this book will work if there's free trade. <laughs> he doesn't say a word about it. He doesn't say a word about it. First of all, I've got big problems with this whole top-down, we're going to help these people attitude that he has. Like, oh, he's in England, right? He's like, oh, we at the UN and the World Health Organization and this other economic development organization. We're yeah, I thought you were going to go with why... You know, why don't you just leave him alone? I thought that well, was going to be your, your complaint. Well, there, there's certainly that. But I'm just going to grant him that maybe we shouldn't leave him alone. I think he should. Um, but rather than do that, you know, he wants to meddle. Fine. Well, his meddling will not work if there's globalism and free trade. Because there's no way you can compete. There's no way you can compete. 
Not if you're having to scaffold up and build technical skills in your rural population. Yeah. Yeah. If you're making a widget, whatever it is, heck, let's say me and you make axe handles <laughs> and we do it by hand and we have a simple lathe that we bought that helps us rough out the axe handle and then we finish them with a draw knife and a mm. spoke shave and we can crank out so many a day and they're really great. All the wood's hand picked. They're the best quality axe handle possible. Well, some company's going to make them on the completely automated. They're going to make them 10 times as fast. They're going to yep. sell them at half of the price. And as long as our, our market has access to those, we're just not going to be able to move axe handles. And then, and, and we can't afford to get in that business. We can't even do it. Nope. My uncle Bill, I have uncles too. Yeah. Uncles are good. Unless you have one of those weird touchy ones. Uncle touchy. <laughs> well, so uncle Bill lives out in, out somewhere in Peoria, he worked for Caterpillar for a long time. But we were having a conversation once over beer. He wasn't Bush Light. What were we drinking? I don't know. But it was cheap. It was good. Cheap American beer. And he was mad because the golf tea, a little slice of wood, says made in China. Yeah. So you're telling me that we can't make golf teas in the United States and compete with China that has to ship them on a boat? And the answer is no. No, you can't. Weber grills, the classic Weber grill. Mm -hmm. I read the other day, well, if you buy a Weber grill, you go down to Lowe's or wherever it is that fine grills are sold and buy one of those things, it's, you're going to find that it was made in China. Well, I read that Weber still makes grills in the United States, but Americans won't pay that higher price and they export all of the United States made Weber grills to Europe. Try and, most, and they're almost all sold in Germany. Try so me. I know advertise I them here. So you know Schumacher has a whole set of formula that might work, and but it's all for naught if you have free trade or global in, in globalism. It just won't work. You know I know there are a lot of people out here that are like I used to be, who are yelling at at me right now about how great globalism is and about how you know we should use our comparative advantages to lift the lot of all people. Well, you know, the guy that was going to make the axe handles, don't give beans for your comparative advantage because he does not have an advantage, right? When Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations talks about, uh, I think it's brandy production and wool in terms of France and England trading amongst each other and their comparative advantages, the guy in the third world country, the guy in rural Arkansas does not have a comparative advantage. For comparative advantage to work, you need one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you are yelling at our show, you know, that's all right. If you're yelling, you need to stop and think about it because you're probably wrong. <laughs> but even, if, you know, the other thing, though, uh, I read books that make me yell. If it's not a stupid book, it's probably a good book. Yeah. This is an okay book, but that is, yeah. and, and he's thoughtful. But I kept seeing, I kept thinking, when is he going to talk about the trade problem? When's he going to talk about the trade problem? And he doesn't. He never mm -hmm. does. Hmm. And by the way, if you have a comparative advantage, I hope you do. That comparative advantage is an enormous creator of culture for you. Texas cowboys come because it's good grazing land and it's not good row crop land. Like their music, their clothes, their food all comes from that comparative advantage. If you're from Finland and they've got, you know, they've got fish and timber, you know, their folklore they're, I mean, everything comes from that comparative advantage. That's one, not everything, but that's one of the things that makes the people who they are. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you have them, but in a lot of places, because of how much capital it takes to make axe handles now, because, you know, our ability to make them by hand and sell them at a profit has yeah. been foreclosed on us. The number of people that have a comparative advantage is none. It's very, very small now. Let's say uh, we don't take care of that. Then you do have the flight to the cities and you have the rural areas depopulated. At some point, your agricultural production goes down or your agricultural production is done by one company who won't know the land, who probably won't preserve the land because they don't care because you know it's Arkansas. Who cares about Arkansas? So pour a bunch of petroleum derivatives into the soil. It'll be good for the next 20 years, and but in the long run, we're all dead. 
No, 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 Carl. In the next 20 years, we're going to come up with a new thing that will then give us another 20 years. And then we have if 20 you could years to come up for the next one. You know, If you could predict technological innovation, that would be something. You know Scott Adams. Yes. Scott Adams has uh, does some live streams, and he, he runs his lips on Twitter quite a bit. And he's interesting. And, but he, he says that most catastrophes – I'm probably going to get some of this wrong, and, but I'm close on the point. Uh, most catastrophes happen slow enough and that the human is ingenious enough that we normally uh, – we can, we can avert those. Okay. Potato famine. Right. COVID. Potato famine was worse. What, right. If COVID had actually been bad – Three billion people would have died. Mm-hmm. Not let's say that all the measures we took were effective and useful and necessary. If it had actually been bad, it would have been nothing. We would have been just wreckage in front of it. Yep, real bad, virulent stuff doesn't care about <laughs> masks or washing your hands or staying home. It hops a ride on a, a mouse that and comes into your house and you're dead. Yeah, and, and Taleb talks about the fallacy of thinking you predict stuff. It's because you look at things in the past and you say, we should have predicted it. Yeah. It's the narrative fallacy. You think that there's a story that you can tell that leads to it, and nope. I want to talk about a thing on 105, which I put a star by. I, I turn to a third class of notions which really belong to metaphysics, although they are normally considered separately, ethics. The most powerful ideas of the 19th century, as we have seen, have denied, or at least obscured, the whole concept of levels of being and the idea that some things are higher than others. This, of course, has meant, of course, like it's obvious to people, this, of course, has meant the destruction of ethics, which is based on the distinction of good and evil, claiming that good is higher than evil. Okay, 19th century, some of the H.G. Wells stuff. That was early 20th century. You flatten down metaphysical categories. You know, why is Arkansas better than New York? Or why is New York? No, they're all the same. It's just economics. If you do that, then there is no ethics. This doesn't mean that if you you believe these things that you can't act well, in my opinion. I, one of the uh, finest people I know is a secular atheist. Yeah, it's fine. I don't think he has the reasons for acting the way that he does. I think he had a good upbringing. Right. It's baked in and he's unaware of it. It's his operating system. I'm, I'm happy he's got it. He's a good guy. I, I trust him. You know, he's a good guy. But you're sitting on a branch where you've, you've sawed off the end of it. You, if you can't consider higher and lower, you know, if all economic activity is the same and we don't care if you're doing slutty Cardi B music or, you know, turnpike troubadours, it, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. Nothing's right. Yep. To do this right, to do anything uh, that Schumacher talks about in this book, Small is Beautiful, Economics of People Matter, people have to matter. You're not going to get a more intact culture unless people believe some things are better than others. That's why I, I agree with Heidegger on this. I think only a God can save us. Heidegger couldn't find one, as far as I know. I was reading Heidegger on technology, speaking of books that made me yell at them. It's like, mm. why do you write like this, Martin? Why can't you just say what you mean? What does his mom call him? <sighs> Marty. Marty. <laughs> you know, you said Arkansas, New York, you know, which one's better or whatever. Right? These things don't have to be absolute. But you can pick, and, the, and that you should pick. Right, and you have your own needs and your own purposes and your own reasons, and you might pick Arkansas over New York or New York over Arkansas, and that's okay. But they're not homogenous, and they are differential. Like you can tell the difference between the two, so now you can make a decision. Carl's probably not agreeing with that. Carl's like, no, Arkansas is better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've been to New York. Yeah, I lived in in the state for a year. I survived. I lived right. upstate, though. Upstate's different. Upstate is different. Yet these places have their relative merits, and they're and they're just not the same. I have a friend who works for a Fortune 500 company, and he said and I was talking to him the other day, and I said, "Well, how's how's work?" You know, and he says, "Well, you know, it's terrible." 
because that's what it is, right? Like if you work for a Fortune 500 company, it's and you're paying attention, it's it's spooky. And I said, well, what's going on? He says, I think they're probably going to mo- move me to Houston. And I'm not going to give his name, and it's hard to not do that. And I said, listen, do they have a gun? And he's like, what are you talking about? I was like, they can't move you to Houston, dude. Like, you can decide. You can go, and that, maybe they, maybe, you know, maybe that's all right. Of course, your kids are here, and they're early adults. Or you can stay, or, or you can move to Denver. Or they're not going to move you to Houston. But you have to pick. You can tell them no. And they may not fire you, by the way. They might. Who cares? I never lost anything in Houston. I'm not I'm not going. <laughs> you never been there? I've been to Houston. It sucks. It's warm. It's terrible. Hey, Houstonians, I hope they love it. You should. I think you ought to be able to in response to our sometimes interlocutor, you ought to be able to write poems about the place you live. Yeah. Uh yeah. Because somebody needs to. Because there's something about it. I could write one about Houston. <laughs> Ode to a giant cockroach. It never freezes there. And their their bugs are big, man. <laughs> Do they have teeth? Oh, gosh. I don't know. Do they I run, grin at you? I run. Here's a good thing about Houston, though. You can plant a tomato plant and get tomatoes off of it until the plant wears out. Dies of old age. Yeah. So that's yeah, cool. there's something for everybody in, in the tropical regions. I remember the first time I was down south, or what I thought was down south, was uh, Tennessee for a band trip in the summer. Yeah. Oh, the bugs were big. We don't have those bugs up here. You ever ran into love bugs in Louisiana? What are the love bugs? I had June bugs dive bomb us once at a rodeo. Well, there are these black bugs that, at a certain time of the year, copulate on the wing. And they will just blacken the sky, man. And you'll drive through there and they'll just, they're just you know, on the windshield, like the, like mud on the windshield. They clog up your radiator. Unbelievable. Louisiana is difficult, but it has its culture I have not seen and its the own love character. Part. Oh, it's rough. Yeah. Oh, but you know, I went to a funeral down there a while back. I don't know if my dad's going to listen to this. My dad's college roommate was from Louisiana and he passed away. And, and so we went down to the funeral in Baton Rouge. Mm-hmm. I remember we were in a crypt and it was a hundred degrees and humid and I was dying. But all those, those ladies, not, not a drop of sweat. They looked perfect. Yeah. Beautiful. I don't know how they did it. Acclimated. They were just, they don't sweat. They glisten. You see, they didn't even glisten. Oh, Makeup was flawless. I, that was an experience. Our friend Bob Tanda, he said, I'm going to come and see you as soon as the semester's over. And I said, well, you better get here that next week. He's from Arizona, and it's so humid here. He'll he'll die. His he'll mold. Get curly. Like, yeah, he'll get out of the car, and he'll just mold. Schumacher, he misses the deal. He misses the deal on free trade and free travel. Nothing he proposes with free travel or free trade will work. Uh, so I just threw the free travel thing in. Uh, once the brain drain stops, the drained area can never recover. Unless you take the ingenious and the clever and the highly industrious at gunpoint and force them back what? to Sevier County, Arkansas, they're not going back. So I liked what he said uh, somewhere in here about Switzerland. And I, I wrote in my notes, mm-hmm. um, Electoral yeah. College, I'm trying yeah. to find the quote. About all the cantons in Switzerland. Yeah. So in Switzerland, oh, page 187 or so. In Switzerland, you have 21 or so cantons. Let's see, bottom 187. The whole of Switzerland has less than 6 million inhabitants, yet it is divided into more than 20 cantons, each of which is a kind of development district with the result that there is fairly even spread of population and of industry and no tendency towards the formation of excessive concentrations. Okay, so that's a good thing. Uh, You don't have Zurich and Geneva, and everything else. You have, you know, all of Switzerland sharing in Swiss prosperity. 
Uh, and so the reason I wrote Electoral College is people, are, this is a big topic of complaint now. You know, why should Kansas have two senators? Well, because it's big and it has a lot of land. And the land has rights. And if you don't give the land any rights, there won't be any people there. And if there aren't any people there, there won't be anybody growing anything there. And then all of the secondary economies in the big cities are screwed. You have to have some kind of distributed governance where the areas that are less populated have proportionally more power. It has to be that way. The land has rights, Carl says. That's hmm. what I say, yes. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> it's like Chesterton says about liturgy. You think you're going to take something out of the liturgy because you don't understand it. Well, no, that's the wrong time to do it. You can only take something out if you absolutely understand it. And if you, you think electoral college is outdated or, and you can't see why it should be there, well, then don't touch it, please, because you don't know what it is. I have a metropolitan friend who I talk to every now and then about these kinds of things. And this friend does not, and I have, I've told this friend about this, and this friend cannot comprehend what I'm talking about. Rural folk and middle-of-the-country folk are so resentful for being ruled by metropolitan areas that metropolitan people probably shouldn't come through here. <laughs> well, they won't. I'm serious. Well, that's good. But they don't under they don't they do not understand the amount of resentment of getting those values foisted on them and not just that, but being forced to compete economically with those areas. So this book here is about the third world. Mostly. Mm -hmm. But I kept thinking, well, what about the Midlands of the UK? Or what about the rural United States? It's the same. It's the same. The, most of the United States, if it's not already a third world country, would certainly be if there wasn't government redistribution payments paid into the poor people of those areas. So just because they could go to the Dollar General and buy what they need to get through the week because of their checks doesn't mean that those problems of the third world don't exist here in this country. They're just being ignored. And on one hand, you could be high empathy and say that these people shouldn't be ignored because I understand their plight and I feel for them. Or you can just be super pragmatic and say, if we keep ignoring this, these people are going to get really mad one day. Well, you could diffuse the situation if you thought about it. How would you do that, Carl? Uh, well, quit talking shit about them. Well, that'd be good. Quit talking trash. Uh, get rid of the interstate commerce, cla commerce clause. Charge tariffs. Mm-hmm. I thought when he, his talk on nationalism at the end of the book, I don't think that's the right thing, especially yeah, I, if your focus is small is beautiful. I think you br rather should be a trust buster. Of course. Don't just make the big company nationalized because you haven't solved the problem of being the huge company. Right. Make it a smaller company. So you need to destroy the corporate veil, stop insulating corporations, for, uh, individuals from corporate liability. Oh, but we wouldn't build airplanes if people were severally liable. Right, that's fine. You know, do you want everybody to have good work and people to be off OxyContin and, and have people all skilled and doing useful work? Or are you more interested in air travel? They're more interested in air travel. They're more interested in air travel because, you know, their friend went to Cancun last month and they're hoping they can go. I get Speaking it. of things which are absurd on the energy scale. Yeah. Air travel, profoundly expensive in energy. Yeah. Uh, things that are heavier than air don't like to fly. I, I used to study aerospace engineering. I know this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it takes a lot to make the thing fly. Uh, he paints an interesting picture. He does point out some. He does point out problems with how people view ac uh, economic aid, and he points out a number of ways where that economic aid could be more useful and more efficacious. He points out problems with economics and how it is like the Borg, and how the idea of economics uh, influences and subsumes all other areas of thinking. Some great observations, but and some it's a great suggestions, but. <laughs> As long as there's free trade and people can travel wherever they want for whatever reason, Yahtzee, none of this will work.
Well, that was part of my complaint on, on subsidiarity is, uh, I love the idea. I wish it were followed. It's a more universal idea, but it is a big Catholic thing. And I'm in this church that says subsidiarity and does everything the opposite of subsidiarity. And who's going to enforce it? Well, the only one that would enforce it is from the top down. So the Catholic Church wants the parish priest to deal with it, not the bishop, and certainly not... Yeah, but in practice, that's not the way it works. Right, right. Or me deal with it before the parish priest does. You know, so the smallest level possible, but absent a a real uh, direction towards the smaller units, it's going to always be conglomerated. Yeah. Which is a great word. Sounds exactly like what it means. To glomerate. To glomerate. (laughs) I don't know how to say this delicately, so I won't be. I think I have been an economic winner. You know, I've started some business and sold some, and I've done well enough. I can kind of do whatever I want to do here in the United States in terms of, you know, I can work, I can not work. I can buy anything I want, not because I've got so much money. It's mostly because I don't want very much, but we're we're doing okay over here. Hmm. Wait, hold on. You don't want very much? I don't. That's an interesting strategy. Yeah. It's, it's easier to play defense than offense. It's easier to keep the dollars than get them. Uh, I think. And three years ago now, I pretty much decided, and this is a luxury that a lot of people don't have, and I understand this, and I don't want you to, I don't want people listening to get me wrong, and of course they will. I decided that I just didn't really want to, didn't really want to worry about making money anymore, and I had the privilege or the luxury to sell my business and not have to do that. And not everybody can, and I, and I understand. But, and, because of that as a part of selling that business and going through that whole process, I started to come around to these sorts of ideas, right? My life became less economic and more focused on, you know, what was the character and quality of the thing. I was making enough money at one point that there was almost nothing that I would do for myself because I could have it done cheaper than I could do it. You get to a point where your hourly take home is high enough that you can hire almost anything done for less than your take home. You know, if you're a $600 an hour attorney, economically, you would be dumb to do anything but attorneying stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the plumber's cheap if you make 600 bucks an hour. Well, he gets 120. Okay, come on in. Take as much time as you want. I, for every minute you do a plumbing, I'm going to be attorneying. Everything mm-hmm. becomes economic. But you, be, but I was becoming disjointed and disconnected from my own life. I didn't, I didn't maintain my home. I did not clean my home. I, we barely prepared our food. Hell, it beca- at some point, it becomes economically foolish, uneconomic. He talks about looking at things as being uneconomic. It becomes uneconomic to prepare food for your children. Mm-hmm. Once I saw, became aware that this was going on, I I just couldn't do it anymore. I have been on both sides of this question or these problems, and I'm going to posit to the person that hates me for saying these things on here, I'm going to posit to you that either this game is working for you so well that you can't see that it's not working, or you're so hopeful that it will, and you're so aspirational that you believe that you will play this game and win at some point that you can't see that winning it is losing it. <laughs> that probably ought to be the bumper at the start of the show. Yeah. So they hear it before they hear all the things that they hate. Right. Now think about that. You make enough money, you have to make a value judgment to prepare meals for your kids. Mm-hmm. Well, I think this is related. I, I'm going to say uh, some of the happiest people I know are monks. Yeah. yeah. And they don't have anything. There might be a, a, a moral in that. Yeah. One happy person I know, I was talking to the other day. I said, did you get your stimulus money? He said, uh, no. I said, well, did you look in your bank account? He said, I don't have a bank account. He doesn't have a bank account. And he doesn't have a credit card. Never has. 
And uh, he said, the last time they mailed it to me, and I haven't got a check yet. And he said, he said, what's the criteria? How do you get it? And I said, well, I think that you have to have a household income of 75000 or less. And he says, oh, hell, I ain't never made that in any two years. He never wanted to. He doesn't care. He doesn't mm-hmm. care. I know a lot of people can't imagine that. I've known the guy my whole life. He doesn't care. Like whatever it takes to do more than that, Mm -hmm. he's not willing to do it. Yeah. And and he's not lazy. He works like a pole barn Amish every day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You were saying that, that you could not work if you wanted to. And I don't think you could. I don't think you could not work knowing you for these, these years. Yeah. If you think of... If you're motivated by this, so the big picture Schumacher stuff, you can't really do anything about. No. Okay, so macroeconomic stuff, you can't do anything about. You're not going to be able to cause a a revival of of culture in the world so that they see these sorts of things. But you could, you the listener, dear listener, could. I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, one of the coaches at the that other place that I work over at Barnum Logic. Oh, yeah. What do you do there? I I coach people. I get them stronger. I also do nutrition. Hmm. Um, could could anyone have openings. could yeah could someone hire you to help them get stronger or less fat? They could and go to barbelllogic.com and sign up with me. Do, do you have a discount code that you could give them if they wanted to save it? <laughs> Actually, no, but there's a referral. So the first month is free now for you people out there. You could also sign up with Mr. Hambrick if he has openings. I, I'm actually full. Check well, out. you could you could request him, and then they'll just deny it. <laughs> but uh, uh, so the first month is free; it's a pretty good deal. So you get a month of training, and then you by then you'll be hooked because we're good at our jobs, and we'll get you stronger and make your life better. But uh, one of the coaches there was talking about fast food. So if I go to McDonald's, which I have tended to do, because it's convenient, mm-hmm. and I get a quarter pound of beef, which is maybe a dollar depending on where you buy your beef. It's probably less than that. Uh, I bought a potato's worth of French fries. And then uh, some bread, ketchup. It's about $2 worth of food, maybe. Throw in another 50 cents for the fountain drink. two fifty for $10 that you paid. And you're doing that over and over again your whole life. Whereas if you got a lunchbox and made your lunch, which I'm trying to do, because so much opens up to you if you just decide to want less. And it's not even less. It's, it's less as in how much money you spend for it. The lunch that I make or that I ask my kid to make, my, I, I tell my youngest son to make me sandwiches, and he does, and it's wonderful. They're not any worse. They're actually better, and they're much cheaper. How much stuff do you need? If you can cultivate your interior life, you know, you can do it with us here at OGB or just do it on your own. You know, you read your books, you say your prayers, you listen to music. I don't know. Whatever you want to do, uh, look to your ancestors. They knew how to cultivate an interior life because they had to. Look to what they did. Whatever's in your tradition, you'll probably find something good. If you can do that, then you don't need to fly to Cancun. You don't need to go see Broadway shows. You don't need the Tesla. There's a lot less that you need. And then the money that you have becomes more. And you become less poor because you have less things that you need to buy. Yeah. You're frowning at me. No, you're you're right. Uh, yes. The economic conditions and incentives make it enormously difficult to do that. It just makes it so hard. And I'm trying. You know I am. Mm-hmm. You know, I was talking to a friend, the same, the same friend that got, may have to go to Houston. And we were talking about these kinds of problems and we were sitting in my wood stove, in my barn, <laughs> talking about this. And he said, well, go, Hambrick, what are you doing about it? I just started <laughs> screaming at him. I was like, you can say that in the break room at your work. You can't say that here. I, I saw my, I'm living in a barn, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice barn though. And he, then he started laughing. <laughs> it is a nice barn. Well, thank you, thank you. You know how much more do you need? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, tell a story. I had a, a 
a class once that a priest who was a pop culture fan, and he would talk about Liz Taylor hmm. and how she had seven husbands or eight husbands, you know, thinking that the next one would make her happy. And he, he'd said, you know, Liz, it's, it, it's not them, it's you. Right. The next time she gets married, that'll be the one that makes her happy. Well, no, no, you keep doing the same thing, thinking that you're going to get a different result. Maybe you ought to do a different thing and get a different result. Maybe the problem is you have some dissatisfactions that you need to work out. And if you could cure those, then you could have stayed with Arthur Miller or whoever else. Who else did she? No. Did she marry Arthur? Whoever else she married. Burton. She should have stayed with Richard Burton. Right. The external goods don't make the internal better. If the internal's wrong, the external are lousy. If the right. internal's right, then the external are tools to help you achieve your good. Small is beautiful. It is if you've got the disposition to see it. I agree. Small is beautiful. I believe that local is the answer, uh, whatever shape that takes f for you. But as long as there's this free travel and as long as there's this free trade, the normal person is not going to be, even in the United States, which is supposedly not a third world country. I don't have much evidence of that, but supposedly it's not. The regular person is not going to be able to get onto the capital, the meager capital they need to live a modest life. You know, there are a bunch of carpet bagging people running from the fire right now trying to buy land in Oklahoma and it's way too expensive. You know, if you're going to build axe handles and you're in Arkansas and you're going to cut down hickory trees by hand and make the best hex axe handles in the world, you're going to have to compete with somebody in Canada that's making them with a, you know, with high speed machinery and highly automated, et cetera, et cetera, buying wholesale lumber that's not quite the same quality and undercutting you by literally 90% in some cases. So, you know, even, even the choice to be small might not get you where you need to be. There need to be some enormous changes that I don't think anybody in power has the moral courage to commit to. You know, that trust busting that you mentioned would be a start. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to tie a happy bow on this. <laughs> you just get frustrated. You say, yeah, I think you're right, but I don't see how this works out. My only point was uh, the big picture stuff you can't affect, but you can probably make things better by affecting your end of it. Yeah. W which is another complaint I have about him, <laughs> which is wh why is he worrying about third world, whatever? Because he's English. Right. The white man's burden. Is that what it is? I don't know. Uh, if there are, there are poor people in India. It's one of the chapters. How to fix unemployment in India. Well, do you need to fix unemployment in India? Right. Ask them. Are they unhappy? Right. You know, by his own principles. Are, are, they're not Western. Well, actually, right. they, they probably kind of are because it's India. But somebody once said the last Englishman is going to be an Indian. <laughs> that happened last year, I think. <laughs> it's just the, the the cultural thing, but uh, so if you look at India and are, are they unhappy? Is this something that needs to be fixed? It's it's kind of a Western temptation to look at things and say I need to fix them. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not. Yeah, that that's one of the things about rednecks <laughs> is that people say like I think there's a stereotype of the redneck that they're lazy and you know, I don't know, like the hillbilly red, the, uh, stereotype, you know, maybe, but they just don't really care about the things that some other people care about. That's the main thing. People don't care about ever, the same things. Oh, sure. There was this book that came out a while back. Uh, what's wrong with Kansas? And it was, uh, a left-wing guy writing, you know, why do Kansans vote against their interests as he saw it? In other words, they didn't vote the way that he, who's an East Coast elite, thought they should vote. Right. Well, the answer to what's wrong with Kansas might be nothing. People eyeballing them and trying to figure out what's best for them. That's hand. My dad calls them hand-wringing 
do-gooders. <laughs> yeah. I think the United States is going to be faced with more and more and more of the problems that he outlines in this book. If you are interested in some of these issues, go ahead and read Small is Beautiful. I think that he's incomplete. Uh, he doesn't really dre- address the problems of barrier to entry to the degree I think he should. It costs more to get into business than poor people can afford. He talks about it some, but he doesn't really deal with it in the way I would like to see him deal with it. I could do it better. Uh, he doesn't deal with the free trade problem. He doesn't deal with the usury problem. He doesn't deal with the credit markets problem. There's a lot that's not here, but he brings up a lot of points that I think are interesting. And these problems are going to become more they're going to get a lot closer to our houses here in the United States in the coming years, I think, than almost anybody is willing to recognize. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth a read. My wife saw it and she was very excited because she's five foot two. <laughs> I, had, I had to explain it was an economics book, not a, you know. All right. <laughs> she's not five foot two, is she? That's what she says. She would never lie. Right. Oh, gosh. What are we reading next time? Uh, I thought we might read uh, Yukio Mishima's book, Sun and Steel, which is a very odd book that I'm halfway through about life and death and words and steel and sun and weightlifting. Sounds like what we need. Yeah, lots of stuff. It'll be Uh, fun. Yeah. What are we going to read after that? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know either. I don't know. That'd require forethought. Uh, yeah. I'm going to throw Kierkegaard at you at some point. Yeah, let's just do some Kierkegaard. Yeah, probably concept of anxiety. I need to dig up my copy and see if it's manageable in a week. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, go to onlinecreatebooks.com slash podcast and sign up for the mailing list. We just humorous. Like, I just ring myself out for you people. I read shit I hate. <laughs> and then I come on here and then try not to say things that are going to get me in trouble. Just go, go sign up for the VIP list and just, just humor me. Just make a burner email and sign up and then go check it once a month. Just humor me. You need a burner email anyway. Oh, yeah. To Denota. What's your favorite burner email place? Uh, if I told you, that would compromise my security. Okay. Yeah. And here's another thing you can do. When one of your friends uh, has got their phone laying around, like just subscribe to our show on their podcast catcher when they're not looking <laughs> or, or at work just when somebody's got iTunes up and they go to the bathroom or whatever, just subscribe to our show on their That'd be a big help. If anybody wants to, and you wanted to like transcribe these to vinyl, that would be good. I'd like that. Let me know if you can do that. We can sell. Except with the vinyl. length of our shows, it's going to be like a four album yeah, that'd be fine. We'll put that, we'll, that's why they used to call them albums. You know, they had those 78s in that big book, you know, that would unfold, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can do that. And we've been kicking around on our other show. We kicked around the idea of starting a zine. I think we should do that too. Sure. And then we could just mail them out to people, mail them 10 copies and say, put these somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I think we should do that. You know what we are? Ooh, we could do a new kind of zine where we just email them a PDF that looks like it's mimeographed mm-hmm. and then ask them to print it and leave it at the break in the break room at work. Does anybody have a break room at work? Does anybody go to work anymore? You know, I'm taking welding <laughs> at the mm-hmm. Votech school. The water fountains don't work because they're disease vectors. You can't get a f- 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 drink so do people have break rooms anymore? Like, can you have a coffee maker that people have access to, or are we afraid it's going to kill us? <sighs> it's the new world. It's the new normal. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, all these things would be good. Maybe you could, maybe you could make a mask, you know, your anti-COVID mask, and it says, listen to the OGB podcast on it. You could do that if you were crafty. Yeah, we're just brainstorming some marketing ideas here. Yeah, all, all these things would be good. All these things would be good. All right, thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, thank go you. read the E.F. Schumacher book. It, it, it's worth it. But, you know, he's a mid-century guy. 
and they're just still enamored with the post-world era and travel and globalism and a brave new world and I think he misses the boat in a few places but you know he didn't ask me and next week we'll be reading Yukio Mishima and uh, he's going to be I think the only only the second person we've had on the show twice isn't yeah. that interesting he's an interesting guy yeah alright thank you guys so much for listening I'll talk to you in about a week 